They were lying. They were going to need to get us through to them. And then, the, anyway, eventually they realized I couldn't say the lines. And it was a very small budget film for its day. It was only 700,000 pounds or dollars, I'm not sure. It started off at, I mean, uh, for a lot of people, that's quite a big budget well, film. Yeah, yeah. But um, so they went away in a huddle, evidently, I was told later, and decided whether they could afford to do ADR, which was overdubbing the lines. But there was no budget at that point for, for ADR. So they decided to take all my lines and give them to the female Cenobite. So, and uh, and that, um, that afternoon, I went back to the, the green room and quietly sobbed inside my makeup and uh, and nobody realized because <laughs> it was just butterball sitting in a corner and uh, so uh, no no tears please it's a waste of good suffering could have been completely apt for that character but the other thing you think about it being slimy um so in these days they have a special um product that they put over to create for example alien slime or to make everything glistening look effect. yeah a glistening effect yeah that kind of gloopy nastiness mm. in those days in the 80s they didn't have that so they sent the 17 year old runner to the local chemist to buy every tube of ky jelly that they had in stock <laughs> and um the, 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 poor, <laughs> the poor teenager had no idea what the meaning of KY Jelly or what its use was. And he came back, he was beetroot with this family pack of KY Jelly. Um, but before each take, they would smother me with KY Jelly. Um, any children here? No, that was good. So it was a bit of a head fuck. Um, <laughs> and um, the, the scene where the house falls on top of him... They had all this polystyrene stuff, evidently, I didn't know, I can't see it, above me. And they had these buckets full of fuller's earth, which is a kind of dust that they yeah. use. And um, <laughs> they said, OK, so you're standing here, raise the knife. When we say, it was kind of acting by numbers by this point. When we say action, raise the knife, we'll make sure that the, um, the boyfriend is in front of you, so it looks like you're going to be stabbing him. And then the house will fall on top of you and you kind of fall out of sight. Fine, I can understand how that's going to work. So I stand there and they say action and I raise the knife and I'm trying to be as menacing as I can. And I raise the knife and I'm holding it like this and there. And eventually I hear, cut, cut, cut! Oh! And uh, the house had fallen on top of me, but because it was all polystyrene and KY jelly and my makeup was three inches thick of foam latex, I couldn't feel anything hitting me at all. <laughs> By which point... My head, which is covered in KY jelly, is now completely wrecked because it's covered in a pound of fuller's earth and dust and bits of polystyrene. So they had to cancel the, the shooting for an hour or two while they carefully went away and cleaned my head off. Shaved to put a ball. Yeah. <laughs> Gave him a head bath. Mm. A nice <laughs> loving one. Yeah. Going back to the beginning, um, how did you initially get the part? So, um, I was at drama school in North London, a place called Mount View, and shortly before I started, um, a few Liverpudlians, funnily enough, had moved down from Liverpool, um, Clive Barker being one of them, Doug being another one, they were all school friends together, and Pete Atkins, yeah. and started a fringe theatre company called The Dog Company. Yeah. Um, which was based just down the road from where I was at drama school. They came to see a production of um, King Lear that I was doing, and a kabuki version of King Lear, which was, but that's another story. And, um, and like what I was doing, and just asked me if I would like to join their fringe theatre company when I graduated, which I did. And we worked together for several years. Um, we went to the Edinburgh Festival, we worked a lot at the Cockpit Theatre, but it was fringe, so none of us were making any money. Yeah. And Clive's head is so full of incredible ideas that it was profit share, but all the profits went back into creating these amazing visions that were in his head. So some of the theatre we did then had a skinned man, so he was playing with the ideas. He, there was a play called History of the Devil, there was another one called Paradise Streets, but we weren't making money from it. Frankenstein in Love, yeah. Yeah, yeah Frankenstein in Love. And Secret Life of Cartoons, which ended up in the West End, actually, but that was another story several years later. So we disbanded after a while because we all wanted to make a living out of being actors. And yeah. Because none of us... You no, know, Clive was just a poor writer um, and director. And none of us were making any money. We were all signing on the dole. Um, so after that, Clive started to um, publish the Books of Blood. He was... Yeah. Uh, which obviously did very well. Um, I hadn't seen him for a couple of years. I did 
<laughs> I did a, a first professional job, which was a follow-up to um, a risque show called El Calcutta. Uh, and this, this show is called Why Not Bangkok? <laughs> uh, you can have an idea of what kind of show it was. Uh, it was very poor. And uh, I, did, I did a whole load of theatre shows which were absolutely awful. And I thought, if I don't get something soon um, that is any good, then I'm going to leave the profession. Um, and I rang Clive out of the blue to see what he was up to. And he said, oh, I've just had two screenplays made into films. Uh, one of Rex. Rawhead Rex. And Underworld. Underworld. Yeah. Thank you. I always forget that one. Well, the, apparently, I th it was either Underworld or Rawhead Rex where the producers actually said to Clive, this is blasphemous. And <laughs> it was an interview I read by him. And he he thought, well, I'd best do Hellraiser myself then. Yeah, well, he, he persuaded... He, I don't think he was very happy with the way they were directed. Yeah. So he persuaded the production company to let him write and direct the next one, which was, which was Hellraiser. So on that phone, as I was talking to him, he said, I'm just about to, to do this film. Um, do you want to play a monster? And, uh, and I said, yes. <laughs> and thinking that, you know, nobody would see it. It would play at a few festivals. And, and here we are, 37 years later... Sitting in real? I know. Oh, <laughs> Bizarre. And two weeks ago, we were in. We were all in um, um, Las Vegas. Las Vegas. Yeah. Seven of us. It yeah. was. It's. It's crazy that it's. It's still as successful and popular. Well, well, arguably, it could be said that it was one of the films that changed the face of horror. You know, so, so, so certainly aesthetically, I mean, the story is a very simple story. Uh -huh. but, but aesthetically in the visuals, it, it's, it's something that I, I, I mean, I remember seeing it for the first time when I was a teenager. And it was just, it, it was something that I'd never seen before. You know, he, even with the likes of things like Nightmare and Elm Street and the Friday the 13th, you, you had the image of the bogeyman in your head. But the sadomasochists from hell yeah. was just like, <laughs> where did they come from? Yeah, Clive did a lot of research on the sadomasochism <laughs> side, um, so I've been told. <laughs> and uh, he had a lot of books. Uh, we, was, we were talking earlier, and I said, back in the 80s, the only thing people really had pierced were their ears. And, and usually then it was only kind of your, that, your left ear, if you're a man. Uh, not, certainly not your right ear. And then this kind of came along, and I remember seeing all these books of piercings from um, African tribes and things that they had, that they were using as references. And uh, certainly I think it, it started a whole trend of, of that. And the sadomasochism stuff, it's... Uh, it's always yeah. been around, but... <laughs> it's always been around, but it's never it been came, on a screen. It, it, it came wonderfully into the open, though, in that. I, I remember seeing um, a French film called La Maîtress, which was about this um, maîtress, um, pseudo-masochist woman who, who runs a brothel in France. And it was, it was a fictional film, mm. but they used real clients of this, of this woman... And uh, there was a real scene of a man having his penis nailed to a block of wood. And uh, it, something like that you never forget. Yeah. <laughs> well, I, 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 ironically, we mention, I'm, when mentioning the, the ladies, is that essentially I, I would say Hellraiser is Julia's film because the amount of people we've been talking today, she's the character that has the most development in the film. Yes. She, she's the... the, she's the the person that you see becoming something and by the time you get to the sequel she's well on her way to becoming that and, and it comes through in Claire Higgins' performance. Claire Higgins does, uh, Clive, Clive credits several people for the success of the film and Claire Higgins is right at the top of the list mm. because to persuade an audience that that is normal yeah. and she does it so beautifully that she starts in this kind of reality and then she kind of spirals down through these layers to, to, to make the audience think yeah this is something that possibly could happen and we all kind of have experienced mm. infatuation, I certainly have um, and unrequited love and and that passion that we have for somebody that doesn't quite come back. And it, it does take you to places that you wouldn't, well, uh, maybe it's just me, but it does take you to places that I you wouldn't normally... But I feel your pain. Okay. <laughs> you wouldn't normally dream of going to. Maybe not as quite as extreme as that. The other person that he credits is Christopher Young's incredible score. Well, he, we, we were talk, again talking earlier about it originally was going to have a, an electronic music score by Coyle. That's right. Yeah, that's yeah. right. Which you can actually find on YouTube if anyone's interested in hearing the original Hellraiser score. 
it is available on YouTube properly and legally to listen to. Chris, Christopher Young, uh, Christopher Fig, the producer, and Clive, the story goes that they were sitting watching the very first time they saw it with the, with the score, and uh, that's the moment they realised that it was going to be a successful film because his score is so epic. Well, it, it, it was one of the few scores... Obviously, being a teenager, I had limited funds, but I had the Hellraiser theme on LP. Uh -huh. and it, because it, it, it is, it's rousing from, from the opening... It, it is, mm -hmm. uh, but it's also a love song. It's a waltz. Well, it's, it's one, two, three, one, two, three, one, two... It's a waltz, um, which completely fits with the theme of love. <laughs> and and the and the dancing that goes on yeah. between the characters. Yes, yes. All the so all it's clever. Yeah. All There's all a lot of clever stuff in there. All, all the wonderful interplay between. It was interesting just watching the end there, and the the thing that I I think most of us felt didn't really work, but it was kind of the the special effect of the day was the optical effects, which they paint on the the. the, the I, I read in, a, I read in a, a feature at one point, it was Clive and some German guy painted them all on by hand. Yeah, they were all painted on by hand, and yeah. they, it's such a shame because they just go... It's, it, it's, it's arguably the only thing that's really dated in the film, apart from the, the shoulder pads and the big hair that the ladies... Wear. Yeah, <laughs> I mean, everything was practical then because yeah. uh, we didn't have CGI... Um, so it, everything had to be, and I, that's one of the things I like about the new Hellraiser film. I don't know if any of you have seen it, but there are a lot of practical effects in that. And I love the fact that the way they use the house becomes the box, and uh, they use a lot of theatrical effects to, to create all the, uh, the box changing and the house changing. So... And it's quite, quite sensibly, they completely went the opposite direction with the Cenobites, because... <laughs> and, uh, we were in the bar watching through, and the, the scenes where the Cenobites appear on screen, and you, you could frame them. Uh -huh. I, I mean, they're, they're so beautifully shot, and I'm down to the costume designs and, and the, the, the practical effects. I mean, I, I don't think they could be bested by even with today's makeup. Well, it was interesting in Las Vegas, we were asked by someone in the audience how we felt about the new Cenobites in the new film, not, having, not wearing leather. And uh, I, I tend to be the comic of the group of the four of us so i said well it's because these days more and more people are vegan and uh no no cattle were were hurt in the making of the new heroes of film um and then doug chirped in tug doug bradley pinhead being the intelligent one of the group saying well actually if you think about it the film is all about skin and trying to get your skin back or loss of skin so the use of leather actually again another very intelligent decision by the costume designer yeah, yeah. what well, what was it first like when you when you had the first makeup test when you first got into costume because because famously Doug's talked about that he walked out and the, the, it was like the, the sea parting before him it, it was just people looked at him with awe uh -huh. but bear in mind you really couldn't see anything. no I couldn't so the first day of shooting I sat in the uh, in the dressing room with with Doug and obviously I couldn't see anything and the makeup was two inches thick so I said to Doug, I'm going to do some facial expressions and can you tell me what the makeup is doing so I have an idea of how I can make, make him move or make, animate this makeup. And so I did some kind of small facial expressions and Doug said, so when you're ready, uh, start. <laughs> So I did some bigger facial expressions, still nothing. Um, by the end of it, I was kind of gurning. Uh, 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 and he went, nope, nope, not moving at all. So I thought, oh, well, shit. It, 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 was, <laughs> it was famously, I think it was Roddy McDowell said when he was in the Planet of the Apes makeup, he had to like, gurn yeah, to yeah, yeah. any expression. And that was nowhere near as thick as your makeup. No, no, it, just, no. it didn't move. So all I could really do, I worked out, was stick my tongue out and walk like a fat a, fat, a pregnant lady, <laughs> so that's kind of <laughs> but, <laughs> that was my motivation. But, but, I mean, arguably, with, with you and Vince, in the, just your presence on screen, because when when Vince first materializes and you see him in that hospital, it, it's it's startling. And and again, Nick is Nick was blind as well, so uh, that whole thing of him putting his fingers into. Um, Ashley's mouth, she had to make that happen because he had no idea yeah, where she yeah. was. <laughs> it was crazy. So, yeah, the first day, it was, was, it was pretty awful, actually, because I suddenly realised that I was going to be sitting in a corner with sensory deprivation for hours and hours and hours so, a day. So was the hospital scene the first scene you filmed as the Cenobites? <laughs> I have no idea. I can't remember. <laughs> it was a while ago. Yeah, it was <laughs> seven years ago. I can't remember what we started with. I never saw the set. So um, the, when we had the rap party at the end of the first film, 
the four of us had to be introduced to the rest of the cast because they had no idea what we actually looked like. Well, he, he, he was famously, um, Doug said about he, he had his face all around London, but no yeah. one recognised him. <laughs> yeah, which is probably quite good, to be honest. And, uh, so. I mean, I mean I d arguably, you, you know, if you think about the intelligent, you know, award-winning films of the time, how many of them have we watched years later? How many iconic, how much iconic imagery has come out of them? That, is argu that has changed the face of certain films, even music genres, as we were talking about earlier. It's, it's, it's a kind of film that hasn't really been copied, either. Uh, so many it's of the films... Though, that they're, but <laughs> too hard to. Yeah, no, yeah, I know. It's too hard to copy. I mean, Clive says it's kind of one of the uh, early zombie films, and I suppose, I suppose it is, because Frank is a zombie, and he's yeah, being brought back yeah. to life. Clive also had an idea. I perhaps shouldn't say what I'm going to anyway. He, uh, I, talk, I was talking to him once, and he said, I, I, I'm going to do the original zombie films. He said, zombie films are so popular these days. I need to get into the zombie film, so I'm going to do the original zombie film. And I went, oh, okay, Clive, w what would that be? And he said, Jesus. <laughs> <laughs> so he, <laughs> he wanted to do, yeah, I know. Ooh. So uh, he, yeah, he, he wanted to do the kind of the whole thing in the cave and the resurrection as the kind of the early zombie films. I don't think he's ever done it. <laughs> I, I think uh, he's been chased with enough torches and pitchforks. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> that might be pushing it a bit too much. Yeah, he's used to that. <laughs> yeah, yeah. So were you surprised by the actual reception of Hellraiser? Um, it's it kind of weird, to be honest, because when it came out, again, there was no internet, so we didn't really know how successful it was. And it, it did its round of, uh, at the cinema, and it seemed to be doing all right. It made a lot of money, I think. Um, and then we moved on to Hellraiser 2, which we did the following year, and that did all right. Um, but you, the, without the internet to kind of let you know how successful something is... Arguably a good thing. You couldn't... Yeah, possibly, but you couldn't really tell. And then we did Nightbreed the year after that. And then it all went quiet for seven years because they all moved production over to um, uh, America. Yeah. Um, and it wasn't until the 10th anniversary that we were invited to do a convention over in the States that we... Uh, we suddenly realized how popular it still was. Um, and in the States, it's, it's huge over there and, and, and various places around the kind world. strange and, considering... The and I think because we started doing the conventions, maybe it kept it going, I, I, I don't know, but... Uh, no, it's easy to see why. It's, uh -huh. it's, it's like you said, it's a film that is... It, it hasn't been imitated, if you think. I, I mean, I mean the, the closest thing I can remember seeing at the time was, it was a Ben Cross film called The Unholy about a dodgy priest. Uh -huh. And um, in the final scenes of that, he's meant to descend into hell. And they, have, and it was the, 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 they started showing like needles being shoved under his fingernails. And I was just sat, he was sat in the real cinema thinking, they're ripping off Hellraiser here. <laughs> but he was nowhere near. Oh, is it Stargate? What's the f there is a, a science fiction film, and I remember watching that. Event Horizon. Event Horizon. Yeah. And I just went, this is, this is Star, this is Hellraiser. Hellraiser That's the Hellraiser box. Yeah. And it is Hellraiser in space. Yeah. And it was yeah. exactly the same kind of imagery and designs yeah. that were being used. Yeah. But it was Hellraiser in space. It wasn't, it wasn't really it anything. It already been done with Hellraiser bloodlines at that point. Yeah, yeah, true, yeah, true. It been done with that. Yeah. Yeah, it, it's... It, it, I'm, I mean, apart from probably some things like in the French new wave of horror cinema, some of the more extreme stuff that's actually come close to Hellraiser, that, but they've never blended the eroticism of Hellraiser with, I mean, I mean the, in Hellraiser, the, the, the violence is only a side effect of what they're doing. Uh -huh. it's, it's not the original intention, is it? And I think that's what people can find so disturbing about it. It's, it's almost a laissez-faire <laughs> attitude. To, to sex and violence, yeah, yeah uh, or, or blending them. I mean, yeah, I yeah, mean, yeah. At the time, I, I, I had quite an interest in censorship laws, and it was bad enough having sex or violence in the film, having sex and violence, but having sex and violence related was just like, yeah, ban this film now. Yeah, my uh, my niece, the first time she watched it with. Uh, my sister-in-law, every time the sex scenes came on, so she had her eyes covered like this. <laughs> um, it, interestingly, Clive did put in, he knew that the censors were going to attack it. Lambs, the so he did. He, did, he put in lambs, yeah. some scenes, I can't remember what they were. Wasn't it? That he, I, I, I remember reading at one point that, that they objected over to three consecutive butt thrusts in the sex scene, yeah. and he had to cut it down to two <laughs> of all the things in a film that has people being flayed alive, yeah. too many buttock thrusts. There, there were certain things that the, he put in deliberately knowing that the censor would cut yeah. it, thinking that if they cut maybe five or six things, they'd leave the stuff that he needed for the film yeah. to, to work. To work, yeah. Um, 
I, I think one of them was my stomach wound. I, I had a very deep stomach wound and I had Almost a scene. Vaginal, you might yes, say. Yes, definitely a, a yeah. vagina in my stomach. And it, it, I was playing with that quite a bit <laughs> of my, with my insides. And that was one of the bits I think that was cut. Uh, it's, uh, surprisingly, that never made it into the restored version. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, I, I mean b b between seeing it on the original VHS release and owning it on VHS, and then when I bought the DVD in the early noughties, and I started watching it, and I suddenly realised this is uncut, or what I'd read about the uncut versions, uh -huh. and Hellbound, and then Hell on Earth, they were all getting released uncut now. And that was the thing which shocked me the most, that there wasn't a big fanfare made about it because normally they say oh scenes and it was only the fact that i was sat watching it and it's the hammer attack uh -huh. which is easily the worst scene in the film because uh -huh. it's got the violence it's got the intention behind it and it was it was intact and i was just completely shocked thinking oh my god this is going to be uncut and surprisingly that was the only bit they cut out i mean obviously a lot more was cut out of hellbound but that that was the i mean i suppose it even that's shocking by today's standards, though, that hammer attack, because it's a crime of passion. D Doug Bradley tells the story of Claire Higgins' screen test. I don't know if you've heard this, but um, he stood in reading for the actresses coming to play um, Julia, and Claire came in, and, and they gave her um, a hammer, and he was supposed to duck, and I have a feeling it was a real hammer, and uh, <laughs> he was supposed to kind of duck out of shot just as she was doing the scene, and she was swiping with the hammer and um, they did the scene and he ducked out of shot and he heard this cut and he looked up and there was Clive and Chris Fig kind of sitting looking completely shocked because she'd missed his head by like a centimeter <laughs> with this real hammer and, uh, and Doug always says you know another centimeter in and it would have been then the final scenes would have been and, and memorial to Doug Bradley who was going to play in his during film casting. yeah <laughs> Boy, you should see the casting tapes if you yeah. think that was bad. <laughs> yeah. So, um, moving on to Hellbound, that, that I'm, I mean, obviously after reading the script for Hellraiser, and I love Hellbound, but it's it's not on the same level. And, uh, you, I mean, even worse, you get killed in it. Yeah. Were you, were you happy with your death in Hellbound? Well, I always thought, I don't know, I always, I always thought that Cenobites couldn't be killed because we were creatures okay. from hell, we were already yeah. dead. Yeah. So I always felt that we were being sent back, but of course they, they kind of wrote it into hell, and to Hellbound that that's what um, was, Dr. Chenard was doing to us. Yeah. So, n no. <laughs> obviously from a personal point of view, obviously I realised yeah. that they were also going to move production over to the States and, yeah. and that they weren't going to take us. So I, I, I had more... In issues with Hellraiser 3 because I think in Hellraiser 1 and 2 the Cenobites are these mysterious priest-like creatures from, yeah. from this dimension of hell whereas Hellraiser 3 suddenly anybody can become a Cenobite and, and there's no well the, it, it's the thing with Shenard in it he's obviously he, he's a man of obsessions and uh -huh. that's why he gets chosen and then all of a sudden it's like, well, just hand your application in. Yeah, yeah, yeah. You want to be a cinemate? You yeah. shop the audience. I had to do loads of stuff for <laughs> years to get that job. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I just, it was a shame. I think they went in the wrong direction there, but... How, are you familiar with the Scarlet Gospels? Yes, yes. Uh, you actually got lines in that. Yes, uh, yes. Butterball I, does appear in that. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I'd like to see that made into a film. Actually, that'd he, be interesting. He actually gets arguably a better death, killed yeah. by a kamikaze <laughs> origami bird, but at least he gets to like verbally slap Pinhead before, before he goes yeah. past. <laughs> yeah, it's it. it, it and I, I seem to remember somewhere that Clive was on about it might be developed, but but then again, this was this was talk about four to five years ago, and but because there was the gestating Hellraiser TV series, which I don't think I want to see, uh -huh. because I, I I mean I was perfectly happy with the remake, and I hope that they can take that in some interesting directions. Yeah, I mean it's not really a remake, isn't it? It's a, a, a it, it's a, it's it's a, an advancement of yeah. the of the franchise, but it's a good advancement. Yeah, and, I mean it, again, one of the I think one of the main problems with Hellraiser is that it's so complete. I mean, it, it didn't need the sequels, I think, and it, it left you with that sense of mystery. That, uh -huh. I mean, I'd arguably, with Alien as well, you know, I mean, I'm, I'm not trashing Aliens, but I, I rank it alongside that, that you, you get everything you need to know for a perfect cinematic experience in those two films. They, they did change the ending of Hellraiser so that the studios saw the rushes over in the States and saw and some of the stuff. Like and it. then they started to like it and then yeah. they increased the budget and then they wanted the ending changed so we could have a sequel because there was yeah, no sequel ever planned. Yeah. And I talked to the special effects guys 
a few years ago who created the, the big dragon creature. Oh, the end, yeah. And he was given a budget of £10. Um, and he was told he needed to come up with that dragon for the next day's shoot. It's just, just incredible which when you think about it. Which is testament to British special effects. <laughs> There's a reason so a lot of countries, he, a lot of people come to Britain to make he, films. He went to the local butcher, he bought every bone they had in the shop, and he worked all through the night creating that dragon. He said every time he sees it, he hates it because he sees all the faults in it. And I went, I just think it's awesome. It, 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 again, along with a KY teenager, imagine yeah. him going into the butchers and coming out with a sack full of bones. Yeah. <laughs> so, um, the questions. So we're going to open up to questions now from the audience. Does anyone want to ask Simon a question? Hello? Oh, we've got... Oh, sorry. That's all right. So what was your favourite play you did with Clive Barker and why? Favourite play? Yeah. Oh. So, uh... Probably Frankenstein in Love, actually, because it was dark and it was incredibly imaginative. And the things we did on stage were incredible, considering we were a fringe company with, with, with no money. And Doug had a wonderful role in it. Also, we had Oliver Parker, who was Sir Peter Parker's son, who used to run British Rail. He was the chairman of British Rail. Uh, and then now is a film director in his own right. Um, and he was pretty incredible. He, he had a skinned man costume that he wore which we created. Um, but all of, all of Clive's... Clive actually wrote me a play called Crazy Face, um, which was on at the Cockpit Theatre, and they were going to be doing it with the Youth Theatre, and he wrote, wrote for me to play the lead in it, but I couldn't do it because I was already... Um, I, I talked to him about it a few weeks ago, actually. I was already cast in something else, so I couldn't do it. But uh, I, I have never seen Crazy Face. Have you seen it? No. Uh-huh. Well, I'm coming, Ellie. <laughs> Make him run. <laughs> well, since this, all, this movie started all of your careers, how is it that uh, you became famous from this movie? I'm not really famous, Ellie, but thank you very much. <laughs> um, what, what, I'm, what I'm grateful for is it's given me a, a career um, of, of fairly constant work, and that's, and that's really nice, and... It's given me a lot of horror films, <laughs> um, which I never kind of expected to go in. I, I, did, I did a film a few years, years ago called Starfish um, with um, Golden Globe winner um, Joe Froggart. Yeah. And it was the first film I'd done in ages, which wasn't horror. And my whole family went, oh, you're not doing a horror film. This is fantastic. We'll all go to the cinema and see it. What was <laughs> the, actually, what, what, what was your family's first reaction to you going, oh, that's me? <laughs> so I remember watching it with my grandfather. Uh, sadly, no longer, with it, no longer with us. And my mother, and every time we came up, she like, was like this. I went, no, Mum, if you do That's that, you'll me. never see me. <laughs> so, yeah, well, kind of weird. Uh, kind of an awkward one to watch with your parents, to be honest. No, for, not for what the Cenobites get up to, though. Is it like, <laughs> <laughs> They're quite know, conservative, my no, parents. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> the, um, I, after doing Nightbreed, you vanished until Book of Blood. Uh, Yes. Which Clive Barker brought you back to the screen. So I saw that they were casting Book of Blood, uh, or starting to do production of it, with Jonas Armstrong yeah. playing Simon McNeil. And the story of the Book of Blood is, the, it's the kind of the opening section of all it's, the books of blood. It's the bookending sections of books yeah. of blood, yeah. So it's about this fraud who pretends that he can contact the spirits. He's 19, um, and he's a complete fraud, but there's um, some psychic researchers who found this house where there are connections to the spirits. So they bring him in thinking that he will help to open these connections, but the spirits realize that he's a fraud. So they leave him in this house overnight, and when they come down the next day, every section of his body has been tattooed with little stories, and they're all stories of the books of blood that follow. So even his eyeball has a story written on it. And Clive based the character of Simon McNeil on me, which is why it was called Simon. But by the time they went to film it, I was like in my mid-thirties, so... Um, I can do it! <laughs> no, no, I didn't, but I said... To, uh, I, I contacted the casting director and the director, and I said, this, this story was written about me, you, you'll have to give me something in it. And they didn't get back to me, so I, uh, I sent 
Cliver text. And the next morning I had um, uh, messages from the casting director and the director saying, of course, we'll give you something in it. So, uh, yeah, they gave me a part of a removals man, which is another kind of recurring well, character that seems to appear in all of Clive's films. I have no play, idea why. Doug nearly played the removals man. <laughs> yeah, he did. That's right. Yeah, Doug, quite wisely. <laughs> Doug was offered the choice of playing the removals man or the monster. And he did consider playing the removals man because... He thought, well, this would be good. My face would be seen on screen. And like I say, we didn't think anything would come of it. We didn't think it would be a successful film. So, uh, so but he may obviously made the right choice. I mean, obviously, when you first read the script, what was your first impressions of actually reading the script? Were you think, oh, they're going to censor quite a lot of this? Um, I don't know. Having worked with Clive before, um... <laughs> I think there's a difference from the stage, but apart from obvious, I, I mean, there was there was certain law, um, court proceedings brought against certain plays, but you, you can generally get away with a lot more on stage probably than than you can get on general releases. I, I think for all of us, um, it was our first film, so we had no nothing to judge it by. So, <laughs> reading a Clive Barker script, we had no idea what what a normal script. Where the, where the levels would be. Yeah, no, exactly. Um, it was more interesting reading the script for Hellraiser 2 because it got to the kind of three quarters of the way through and it was just special effect after special effect after special effect. Yeah. And it was very difficult to, to follow it as an actor and yeah. get a kind of through line on what was actually yeah. happening. Because, it, 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 I mean, essentially Hellraiser is a, a twisted family love story yeah. <laughs> that could, could easily play out without the Cenobites and that's what's so compelling about it. And it, it's just that the auditors turn up and think, sorry, Frank, you've had your dues. Yeah, yeah, and we were saying earlier that the, the Cenobites aren't really the monsters. They're just doing their duty, which is to come from hell and collect payment um, from these crazy people who can't find enough pleasure in the world, so reach out to somewhere a bit more extreme. But, it, but it, the it, monster is Julia yeah. Oh, yeah. and Frank. Yeah, well, well it, it, one of the things that I, I do love about Hellbound is the development of Julia and to see Frank get his comeuppance and have him stuck in hell where he deserves to be, you know, and the fact that Julia gets promoted over him. It's, uh -huh. you know, it's, it, it, it was only recently that I found out about the, um, the, the final scene of Hellbound that was filmed with Claire rising out of the mattress, but because she didn't want to continue, which I, I think is such a shame because, I mean, how many female-driven horror franchises were there at that point, and especially with arguably such a powerful leading character. You uh -huh. know? I just, it, was, it was such a shame that it, she didn't carry on in the role, because wasn't she meant to... She was meant to be in, like, a pure black dress with black contact lenses. I, I don't know. I don't know. It, 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 it was, I'd, I've seen worlds still from it, and I, I've, I've read a page of the script or something where Jason, she writes Jason, out of the Jason, 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 Jason. <laughs> I know you're having a blast. <laughs> you like you're having a sick time, mate. Eh? But there's some people that have got some more questions. Oh, and question then. Yeah. No, you're just saying. <laughs> That's for you, young man. Thank oh, you. Uh, hello. Uh, I just want to ask what your thoughts on modern CGI effects compared to the 1980s, because I watch a horror film from the 80s, and I totally believe, I totally believe in the effects. And I watch a film now, and there's always a back of thought in the back of my mind is it's like this isn't real do you know what it's, i mean it's ironic isn't it i remember when kind of cg started happening in the cinema and at the time it was completely magical but now it's reached a stage where they can do anything really anything they want to and it, it kind of loses the magic um I'm, I'm a great believer in the special in the practical effects if they can do them but but they have to be of a standard now that they can compete with cg um but it's great for the actors as well if you can work um, um, it's interesting now that they're using these um, digital studios where the whole of the floor and the, everything around them is a controlled environment with a digital screen which surrounds them. Um, and it, that, that alone is so much better than working on a green screen because at least you've got something to relate to. You can see the environment you're supposed to be in, whereas a green screen, you've, you're just getting nothing back. It's just your imagination and, and the um, communication with the director and his vision. But, yeah, no, I agree. I think practical effects are great. I think CG is great in its place, but it, it does... We just accept everything can be magical now. It's, uh, it's, it's a new place we've come to, but, they know, that's progression, I suppose. <laughs> no. <laughs> um, do you watch modern horror movies? And if so, what has jumped out at you in the past few years or something you've gone, OK, that's cool, I like that? So... 
Um, uh, me and a friend uh, persuaded Clive to let us write the screenplay for one of his short stories from the Book of Blood uh, called... We were going to change it to the human race. Um, I can't remember the name of it. Is it about the... It's the race that takes place outside Parliament. Yes, there's a race that happens in London, yeah, and every yeah. hundred years, yeah. to, to who, what to humanity control. doesn't know is that it's a race between the devil and... And if the devil wins, then he has control of the human race for the next hundred years. So we, we were... We persuaded Clive to let us start writing the screenplay for that. Um, and... We realised we hadn't seen a horror film for a long time, so we saw some of the Saw movies just to see um, kind of where the ball was, you know, how far you could go. And, um, and that was quite shocking because <laughs> it was kind of torture movies and a lot of people having their ankles cut and stuff. And uh, so, so it seems you could kind of get away with anything, but I'm not a great fan of that. that. I think that you need to create... Um, the the atmosphere to create horror and I think that's more important and the tension uh, is more important than necessarily just kind of violence you you can have the violence but the more important stuff is is to create that that feeling of dread that the audience gets that something is about to happen one of my favorite films was an Australian film which I can never remember the title of where nothing really happened you never see the monster but this woman's in a cabin in outer Australia and there's something outside and it becomes almost unbearable because the tension just builds up and up and up and you just think, please let something happen because I can't watch this film anymore. I can't remember where it ends, but yeah. <laughs> We've got a question up the back there. Oh. Oh. Hello. Hello. Um, how did you come about getting the part in the film? Were you seeked out or did you audition has someone already asked this I am so sorry <laughs> can you repeat that Tom <laughs> yeah. he said uh, how did you get to get the role in, in Hellraiser like how did you meet yeah, Clive and Clive, yeah. Clive offered it to me it was, it was that simple I was very very lucky I think we were all very very lucky to be honest um, uh, it, it, our, our lives would have been very different had we not known Clive and Clive is such a genius. His mind is is incredible and doesn't stop. I was with him a couple of weeks ago and he said he's working on four different projects and he's just writes and writes and writes. And even back in the in the eighties when I first knew him, um, he would spend all day locked in his room. If you went to see him you'd sit waiting for two hours and then he'd come out and give you ten minutes of his time when his, his brain wasn't creating more and then off he'd go again. So you he, he's very disciplined. Um, and a bit of a recluse these days, or probably always, because he needs to get this stuff out of his head. And uh, these days he's a great artist as well, so he's got incredible... His house is full of incredible artwork, which... If you look at the Aberat books. Which yeah, is a, a he, all example. the work in the Aberat yeah, books. Yeah, he painted them. So we're wrapping things up now, and I'd like to say a big thank you to Mr Simon Bamford. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. For coming and spending this time. And... Chad.